Hello everyone, my name is Gerald Yu from National University of Singapore. Today I'd like to talk about circuits for human health, which is the last talk from the ISSC 2022 Circuit Insights. Let me introduce myself. I got my bachelor's, master's, and PhD all from KAIST, which is Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And since 2017, I've been a faculty member at National University of Singapore. And my area of expertise is in circuit design with the applications on the biomedical circuits and systems, body area network, and ultrasound system on chip. This is the outline of today's talk. I'll be introducing the circuit for human health, and I'll move on to the biopotential readout circuit basics. After that, I'll be talking about signal processing with the machine learning to enable the circuit for human health with examples, and I'll summarize my talk. Before moving forward, let's take a look at this graph, which shows the blood glucose level of a patient suffering from diabetes type 2 throughout the day. This normal blue band is shown as a normal band, and if we monitor this person from A or B point, that result would have been normal. But if you look at the graph, you can see that's absolutely not the case. The problem is many chronic diseases or conditions have similar issues. Monitoring this person at a given point of time may not necessarily reflect the actual condition of a patient. That's why the NIH, which is National Institute of Health, has proposed the four P's of medicine, which reads predictive, personalized, preemptive, and participatory. And to enable this, we can see that the continuous health monitoring is very, very important. Okay, to enable the continuous health care, you might think about two types of sensors that you can wear. First is that you have the sensor which amplifies the physiological signal, and then you can transmit the data to a base station or with the uh, smartphones or PCs to process and detect the abnormality. Or the second case is to integrate everything on chip, meaning that you will amplify, you classify, and detect this abnormality on chip. If you compare the two cases, you will see that the power consumption of the latter, which is a fully on chip, will be two orders of magnitude smaller. And this is because if you look at the pie chart, most of the power consumption in the first case will be dominated by the wireless transmission. And this is no exception even if you use the low power radio. So for this pie chart, I use the CC2500, which is, so to speak, a low power radio. And that's because the amount of power, amount of data to transmit is enormous in case of EEG, for example, where EEG stands for the electroencephalogram. Now, this is similar to most of the chronic conditions or chronic diseases. So the message here is we'd better go for fully on chip, amplify the signal, digitize it, and classify on chip as well. Now that you have seen the system level challenges, Let's look at the biopotential signal more in detail that we are trying to amplify here. And I have shown uh, three exemplary biopotentials, which are electrocardiogram, EKG, from your heart, electroencephalogram, which is EEG, from your brain, and electromyogram from your muscle, EMG. The first thing you'll notice in this graph is that the amplitude of the signals are very weak. So you can see that EEG, for example, is in the orders of microvolt, EKG goes to around millivolt. Now, also, one thing to note is that the electrode DC offset, which means the DC level coming from the positive port and the negative port of the amplifier, will be always different. And that is incurred as a, reflected as an electrode offset. And the second, is also very important in biopotential are 50, 60 hertz interferences. You cannot get away from it these days. And this couples unnoticingly to your body, and then you'll be reflected as a common mode to the amplifier's both positive and negative input. So the amplifier need to have a really good CMLR to amplify it. I'll talk about this in the coming slides. And also the amplifier 
also has 1 over f noise, which unfortunately is exactly matching with the signal band of interest. So the amplifier also has to deal with this noise, otherwise you'll be amplifying the noise. Now, this slide summarizes the readout circuit challenges in the biopotential amplifiers. First of all, I already mentioned to you that the signal that we are trying to amplify has very weak amplitude. Typically for EEG, for example, is in the microvolt region. Second, the electro DC offset, I already mentioned to you, is the difference in the DC level between the positive and negative terminal, and it may reach up to 100 millivolts. Third is the 1 over F noise, which I also mentioned in the previous slide, as well as different offsets, which I'll be talking in detail in the coming slides. And the fourth is the limited common mode rejection ratio. It, this means that if the differential amplifier is ideal, you should be suppressing the common mode, which means the same signal coming to the plus and negative port of the differential amplifier. But in reality, you cannot suppress the entire common mode, which will result in degraded CMRR. And I also mention this in detail in the coming slides. Fifth is the limited input impedance. As uh, the amplifier's perspective, if you want to have the voltage signal from the source coupled to the amplifier, you'd better have high input impedance because this is to, this is to avoid having a loading effect. So you can pass all the information, the voltage information to the amplifier. But in reality, the amplifier will have a finite input impedance, which will result in some issues. Now the sixth is the electrode mismatch, which I also talk about in the next slide. Uh, lastly, the 50-60 Hz common mode interference is particularly important for biopotential amplifiers. So in the previous slide, I mentioned the offset is an issue for the biopotential amplifiers. So let's take a look at what is the impact of an offset. As you can see, this is an inverting OP amp configured, and the gain of this OP amp is defined by the feedback resistance divided by the source resistance. The way we derive it is that because of the virtual ground over here, the voltage over in this negative port will be zero, so the current flowing in, which is V in divided by RS, is the same as current flowing out, which is minus V out divided by the RF. And if you do the math, we'll find the V out will be minus 1000 millivolt, which means the gain is the ratio of the feedback register versus the source resistance, which is 100. Now, what will happen if you just have a 4 millivolt of offset here? I already mentioned to you in the previous slide, the offset, like DC offset, the electro DC offset, may go well up to 100 millivolt. And these uh, amplifiers offset may go up to tens of millivolt if you design, don't design it carefully. So what happens if you have four millivolt offset? Now you do the same calculation. Current flowing in is the same as current flowing out. Now the difference is that this voltage over here will be four millivolt. So the difference is 6 millivolt over the source resistance of 1 kilo ohms. And if you calculate, the result is now only minus 600 millivolt. So just 4 millivolt of offset in the input incurs around 40% degradation in the gain. And then you can see that the offset, however small it is, has a huge impact in the output. And since the biopotential signals, typically the source is very, very small, that degradation in the gain is a huge problem. And another problem here is an offset of a matched CMOS amp can reach up to millivolt range. So we have to do something about it. So let us start from this one OPM instrumentation amplifier or IA. If you have the OPM configured this way with the plus port with the R1 and R2 ratio and also the negative input with the R1 R2 ratio with the V out coupled to the negative feedback, the difference, differential gain will be R2 divided by R1. The way you can induce this is the similar uh, way you do it with the previous slide. This voltage over here will be the voltage divider of the V input to the ground. And that is the same voltage as whatever you're seeing here. So you can do the voltage current, I mean current flowing in, the same as current flowing out. And you'll be getting 
the gain of R2 divided by R1. Now this configuration is fairly simple and you can have fairly large input voltage range, which is a pros, which is good news. However, there are some issues here. First of all, the biggest problem is the input impedance. If you carefully observe this gain relation, in order to have high gain, you either need to have high R2 or low R1. But if you have a low R1, the problem is the input impedance, which is R1, because the virtual ground is over here, the input impedance you are seeing from the input port will be R1. If you have a low R1, the gain, as you can already see, gain will increase, which is good news, but the input impedance will drop. And what did I say about the input impedance in the previous slide? Is that if the input impedance of the amplifier is too low, then the loading effect will happen. This means the signal will be degraded before you even start to amplify it. So this is called the loading effect, which is a serious problem with this one OPM instrumentation amplifier. On top of that, increasing the R2 to increase again will incur the noise, thermal noise problems. And also, because of the practicality, the R2 mismatch, R1, as well as R1's mismatch, will result in degraded CMRR. To resolve the issues we saw from the 1 OPM in the previous slide, we have been using this classic 3 OPM instrumentation amplifier for a long, long time. The gain of this 3 OPM um, configuration will be 1 plus 2 R1 divided by RG. And to derive this, you can see that the second stage over here is nothing but the 1 OPM differential amplifier we saw from the previous slide with R2 and R2 over here, which means the gain is one in the second stage. To get the first stage gain, you can apply the superposition, meaning that, for example, let's label this as V1 and this as V2. If you want to get the value of V1 caused by V plus and V minus, you can split that in a way that you can first short the V minus to ground and to get the component of V plus all the way to V1 and vice versa. Now you can short the uh, V plus to ground and get the V minus that contributes to the V1. And you subtract that V2 and V1, which will yield the gain of this first stage. Now, if you get it, you will see that gain is one plus two R1 divided by RG. And the good news here is that since now you have the input port coupled to the plus port of the OPM, the input impedance will be very, very high. So the loading effect I referred to in the previous slide is minimized. And now, because the gain can be controlled by just single register RG, this is resulting in ease of gain control. Compared with the previous slide, if you want to control the gain, you have to control two registers at once, which is not easy. Now, this still has an issue. First of all, it has a limited common mode rejection ratio because the CMLR relies on matching of these R1s and R2s, which for the passives, it's not easy. There will be always mismatch. And since you are using three OPMs, power consumption will be higher compared with the uh, single OPM case. In the previous slide, I mentioned to you that 50, 60 hertz common mode interference is a big issue in biopotential amplifiers. So here I have included an experiment I did in my lab. So I am grabbing the oscilloscope probe with the ground pin floating to replicate the wearable environment. And you can see from the oscilloscope screen that we have nice sine wave of seven volt peak to peak. Now it's seven volt peak to peak. The, the signal of interest that we are talking about is in the millivolt or microvolt region, and a common mode is in volts order in the wearables. So this is why we need to, to have a really high CMLR suppressing the common mode from the amplifier. So I'll be talking about the CMLR in the coming slides. Uh, just as a side, no side note, you can even harvest energy from this body coupled noise per se because it's so high. Now, to suppress the CMLR or common mode rejection ratio, you can have high CMLR amplifiers. And typically to get the high gain, you're cascading multi-stage OPMs. And here, let me ask you one question. If you had a choice of high CMLR amplifier 
and a low CMLR amplifier to cascade. And you want your goal is to have a high CMLR from the input all the way to the output. Then should you place a high CMLR amplifier in the first input stage, which is A1, or should you place it later stage, like A2? To find that question, the answer to that question, you can see the following. The input can be decomposed into a differential portion and a common mode portion, where the common mode portion will be suppressed by the CMLR of the first stage, and that means the intermediate stage V01 is A1 multiplied by the V in. Now, the V out is the A V01 multiplied by the second stage gain, which is A2. And if you further decompose it, you will find that the first component is A1 multiplied by A2 multiplied by the input differential, plus minus the second term, which shows the common mode portion. And if you look carefully, this shows that the overall CMLR of the amplifier from input all the way to the output is 1 over CMLR1 plus 1 over A1 multiplied by the CMLR of 2. So this means the CMLR of the first stage will dominate because the second stage CMLR will be multiplied by A1, which will be 1 over CMLR of the amplifier if you add them together. Expanding this to a multi-stage CMLR with the uh, passives in the first stage, let's say you have some uh, registers in front of the multi-stage amplifiers, you expand this analysis and you will, see, you will conclude that 1 over CMLR of the overall amplifier will be 1 over CMLR of these passives, which is, let's say, registers or capacitors, and then the 1 over CMLR of the amplifiers. And you can see as these passives are in the first stage of the amplifier, the mismatch of these passives will dominate the overall CMLR, which is not a good news. Because why is that? Typically, the off-chip devices will high, have high mismatch. The tolerance of a good matched passives off-chip will be probably in the orders of plus minus 5%. So that means, the over, however well you have designed the amplifier, the overall CMLR will be dominated by the passives. So since the use, usage of the off-chip passives are not attractive, we can use the on-chip devices which typically has better mismatch characteristic than the off-chip ones do. But still, due to the uh, process variation, there are some fundamental limits to the mismatch. That's why we need to have a dynamic offset cancellation such as chopper stabilization to mitigate these issues. So, chopper stabilization is commonly used in biopotential amplifiers to mitigate the dynamic and static offset. And here, I will have a very brief introduction of it. The chopping, you'll have an input, which is differential. It is denoted as one line here, but it's actually two lines, well, positive and negative port. And you'll be swapping that with the clock frequency of F chop. So the blue line, which is denoting the signal, will now be looking like a square wave if the blue was a DC value. And the dotted, red dotted line denotes the offset and with the noise. And once the amplifier is passed, you will see that the, the signal component has been amplified, so as the offset and the noise. If you demodulate with the same clock frequency, what you'll be seeing is that you now have amplified version of the signal with the modulated version of the offset because the offset only goes with the single modulation whereas the signal goes to the two modulations and after you go with the low pass filter you will now get a very nice uh, amplified version of the signal to better understand it it's better you see it in the frequency domain the signal which was in the baseband is modulated, up modulated with the clock frequency into higher frequency, just like in the AM modulation. And then after you demodulate, the uh, one over F noise and the other offset will be now up modulated, whereas the signal goes to the baseband, the other signal component goes to the twice the frequency of the clock. And if you have low pass filter, low pass filter the other components, now you'll have a nice recovery version of the amplified signal and the noise will be upmodulated and filtered it out. Of course, in reality, you have some other issues related to the chopper as well. 
For details on these chopper stabilization, you can refer to the SSCS magazine as well as SSCS YouTube channel presented by the two, uh, two presenters from the Circuit Insights. Now, let's say we have amplified, successfully amplified a signal with the uh, good amplifiers in the first stage. Now it's time for us to process the signal with the machine learning to determine if this person has a normal or abnormal condition. Let's look at some examples as well. Uh, as an example, I'm giving you a seizure and epilepsy. So the prevalence of epilepsy is around 2 million in the US or 70 million in the worldwide, which is significant numbers, and is higher in developing countries and children groups are reported. Uh, one interesting aspect of our seizure from the EEG is that typically, not always, but typically you have an electrical onset prior to clinical onset when it comes to the EEG. And of course, many other chronic diseases have similar characteristics. So if you can actually monitor this electrical onset prior to the clinical onset, you will have a chance to intervene and close the loop as well. But if you look at the current seizure tracking method, is we are still relying on interviewing the patient. So for example, clinician sits with the patient and asks how many seizures did you have throughout the day, throughout the last two weeks. And based on that, the medication is given. But that doesn't work for a two or three year old kid. So that's why it will be beneficial if the circuit can detect the seizure and declare and record this raw data and potentially also close the loop by providing stimulation or drug release. That sounds easy, but the problem is there's a huge patient-to-patient -patient variations in the EEG pattern. You can see that uh, we have a stereotype when the seizure strikes, the EEG pattern will be become noisier, which is perfectly matching for the patient on the left. But if you look at the patient on the right, when the seizure strikes, the EEG pattern relatively gets quieter compared to normal. On top of that, we have the patient-to-patient intrapatient age to age phage variations, which means even with the same patient as this patient ages, the pattern may change. And also we have different types of seizure like generalized case whereby you can monitor seizure from all over your skull, whereas you also have some absent seizure, you, the patient doesn't recognize he or she goes to the patient, so the seizure, or focal seizure where you can only monitor from specific point of the skull. So how do you deal with these variations? It will be very tough for our hardware to detect with these patient-to-patient -patient variation, for example. You might think that we can do it with the machine learning. Yes, we can. Can we just do it with the deep learning? Well, let's take a little bit careful look at it. So here I listed the patient-specific seizure detection characteristic. First of all, you need to have energy efficiency to have a minimum of three to five days of monitoring and also a small form factor. And the latency is an issue because you want to make sure the electrical onset is detected prior to clinical onset. So typically that gives around two second latency uh, as, a, as a ballpark. And most importantly, you have very limited training sets, meaning that you typically have no more than one or tra two training sets per patient because these training sets are basically the uh, EG patterns you capture through the hospitalization and you are praying for that the seizure event to happen during that hospitalization. So detect these abnormalities from seizure pattern from the EEG, it'll be quite natural for us to think about using artificial intelligence or machine learning. Now, uh, before we, we go any further, let me define the language I'll be using in my presentation. So in the world of artificial intelligence, there is machine learning and within machine learning, there are traditional machine learning such as SVM, decision tree, nearest neighbor, and etc. And there's also neural network based such as CNN, DNN, LSTM, and etc. And uh, should we use the neural network by default for the seizure detection purposes that I just mentioned in the previous slide? Well, let's take a little bit closer look at it. Now, for seizure detection and for machine learning, there are two types. One is the real-time onset detection, where you need to be patient-specific because, as I said, there are huge differences between patient-to-patient -patient pattern. 
Here the latency is a big issue. You need to have less than two second latency with good accuracy. And here you have to also focus on the sensitivity and specificity at the same time. And there are prediction and post analysis where the patient non-specific can be done. And here the latency is not an issue. That's a perfect fit for DNN. However, for the real-time message section, you'd better go for machine learning, especially when you have very limited training sets. And this is also what uh, you can refer to Prof. Marianne Verhust, where she talked about this topic. Just to summarize, for arrhythmia and diabetes, pro probably generalized perfect fit for the neural network is there. However, for seizure and epilepsy from surface EEG, this is where uh, patient-specific traditional machine learning will be probably a better fit. Now, also in the biomedical as well as circuit for health, you need to also think about one more thing, that reporting accuracy itself is not enough. You have to report both the sensitivity and specificity. So when I say the sensitivity, this is where the symptom, put in a simple way, is you, how well you are detecting the symptom as a symptom. And the way to draw it is that you are dividing the true positive, divide by the true positive with the false negative. Now the specificity is the other way around, how well you are detecting the normal pattern as normal. And to induce that, you can divide the true negative, divide by the true negative, plus the false positive. So there may be a case where you have the high sensitivity but very low specificity and vice versa. And that's typically what's happening in the you know, biomedical machine learning. So you have to concentrate on whichever is more important for your application and then you target properly what classifier will be the best shot. Now here is an example of circuit for health which integrates the amplifiers the uh, on-chip machine learning, and also the stimulator to close the loop. Once the EEG data is amplified, it'll be classified using the onset and termination detector. It's using the traditional machine learning for low latency with the limited training set. And once the seizure is ejected, you can suppress the seizure by applying the stimulation current. Right? This is a good example of an SOC with the fully integration, integrated uh, healthcare. Now, there are some recent circuits or SOCs on human health, which I would like you to, rec I mean, I'd like to recommend you to uh, read. And some of them are from this year's ISSC, such as the 256 channel neural tree SOC for epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, and also a uh, neuromorphic classification neuromodulation SOC from 2020, ISSC, and also wirelessly charged retinal processes with the nanoware Race, which was also reported in 19, uh, ICC 2020, and a cubic meter, millimeter scale neural stimulator powered by the ultrasound, which was published in Nature Biomedical Engineering in 2020. Uh, please, uh, if you have time, I would like you to recommend reading these papers. Okay, let me conclude my talk today. Uh, when it comes to the circuit for human health, System level consideration is required. It's not only about the circuit, but also the system level with respect to the circuit. And we shouldn't forget what our ultimate goal is. For example, if you're talking about human health, we need to think about how well you're classifying with the high sensitivity and specificity at the same time. And that means the platform, analog front end, DBE, digital back end, and system integration all has to be in harmony. And circuit for proactive healthcare is where you have the biopotential redox circuits to deal with the offset mitigation. I briefly mentioned to you about it. And you also have to think about the energy efficiency, convenience, safety, and reliability at the same time. And after you have successfully amplified a signal, you can now do the classification on chip as well. And that for that aspect, we can apply the machine learning for personalized healthcare, and that's a trade-off between available number of training sets, processing power, and energy budget. And detection of epileptic seizure, for example, is possible prior to uh, electrical onset detection prior to clinical onset using the surface EEG. And that's a good example of how circuit can be helping the human health. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Here are some references and resources you can refer to, including the SSCN Magazine and YouTube channel. Thank you.